everyone and welcome back to another episode here at the damage report. I almost said we're like totally back to normal, but we're not because we didn't have a Monday, which like the, the best thing about a three day weekend is that it's three days. The second best thing is that it's a constant reminder to us that all weekends should be three days. The third best thing is that the next week is just four days. <laughs> I love it. And the fourth best thing is uh, pretending that it's Monday. And we have a couple ways we're gonna do that. The first is that we are very lucky to be joined on this Tuesday by Francesca Fiorentini. How's it going, Francesca? What's going on? I thought this was my show now. I, I think most people would probably prefer, but as much as I care about what the audience thinks, on this one point I shall not yield, it's mine and I will okay. have it. Okay, so you did an amazing just... job, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, it was so fun and shout out to all the producers, Sophie, Marissa, everyone crushed it. It was really good. Thanks to the Dragon Squad for just holding me and containing me and like, you know, petting my hair and telling me <laughs> I'm pretty. I just need that. And also, yeah. happy pride everybody. It's June. It is. We're vaccinated. We are well, some of us, yeah. As I talked about briefly on the pre-show today, um, you know, Pride festivities have started off not always in the ways you might expect. Like in Florida, uh, they launched us into Pride Month by um, banning all transgender uh, students from participating in uh, women's sports. So that's one way to tell the country what you're all about. But uh, there are other ways that it will be celebrated here at the TYT Network. We have a little tradition where every year we have our LGBTQ Pride special. And that's tonight, by the way. So we're gonna be doing that later on tonight, hosted by the amazing and delightful Jason Carter. I'm gonna be here and we're gonna have Adrian and a bunch of awesome guests who are gonna be joining us. That is tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific time. So definitely tune in for that. And to sort of launch us into that special, we've got something special for you too. I'm actually wearing it. Oh, the long rumored finally here rainbow pride dragon is now available at shoptyt.com. And today only, all of the profits from shoptyt are gonna go to the Trevor Project. So you can pick up the awesome new shirt, show your pride and also give a little bit of money to a group that deserves a bunch of pride, the awesome Trevor Project. So that's all waiting for you. And yeah, with that, Francesca, are you? Ready to do this thing? Someone said, I just saw it. John needs a scepter, Fran needs a crown. Is that, <laughs> is that, I think I like that. I think I like that. Thank you, Twitch. Uh, anyway, yeah. oh, by the way, uh, whether you're on Twitch or YouTube, thank you everybody for being here. Hopefully, you've already hit the like button. That helps for some reason. We all have to uh, live in fear of the algorithm. So please help us fight back by hitting the like button. And with that, oh, one other thing. Uh, I know a lot of people are concerned. Sophie, don't give me that look, this is important. Uh, I know a lot of people are concerned. Hey, this is Tuesday, we didn't have our Monday. So does that mean no top 10 list? Uh Uh-uh, we are gonna do a top 10 list. So filming uh, right after this, uh, Francesca and I are gonna be filming uh, the top 10 things that would be in our writers. Um, We'll see if we have any overlap with Bernie Sanders and his king bed, but we'll be recording that and releasing it later on today for all of our tier two and tier three members on YouTube. So you have that to expect, you also have news to expect. And because I want to keep Sophie happy, we're gonna transition right into the news right now. <clears throat> All across the country, Republican legislatures have responded to their inability to win elections by trying to make it so elections don't count for anything. And mostly they've succeeded in states where they control state government. They've been cracking down on mail-in voting, voting hours, all sorts of things like that. But not everywhere have they seen such success, at least not yet. In Texas, they had one of the most bonkers anti-democratic bills. And for now, the Democrats, I'm reading fought back. <laughs> that can't be right. We're gonna have to, Sophie, could you fact check that? And and won? What? In this economy? No, they <laughs> kind of did. For now, after a lengthy debate in the State House of Representatives, in which Democrats raised numerous objections, staged lengthy question and answer sessions, and leveraged procedural maneuvers, that's sexiest of terms, leveraging procedural maneuvers, Democrats departed from the chamber 
leaving it 14 members short of the required 100 member quorum to continue business. Without the requisite number of legislators, the Speaker of the State House adjourned the session around 11 p.m. local time, effectively killing the bill for this legislative session. That flight from the chamber was sparked by State Representative Chris Turner, the party's caucus chair in the House, who sent a text message to members at 10.35 p.m. local time. Members, take your key and leave the chamber discreetly. Do not go to the gallery, leave the building. I feel like I'm getting like a little advanced view of like the next season of Game of Thrones, all the political machinations. So they left, they basically left and then you can't pass the bill. So why, why did they have to do all this? Well. The measure would have made mail-in voting more difficult by requiring voters to supply more information, prohibiting local elections officials from sending out absentee ballot applications to anyone who has not requested one, or from work uh, from working with uh, get out the vote groups that encourage Texans to vote by mail. It would have also prohibited the after hours and drive through options that voting rights advocates said helped black, black and Latino voters in the Houston area uh, back in the 2020 election. It would have required all weekday early voting to take place between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., prohibiting Houston from again offering 24 hour early voting opportunity. And it would have barred early voting on Sundays before 1 p.m., which effectively limits the souls to the polls after church get out the vote efforts that are popular among black churches. And Francesca, there's a lot about this that is nonsense, but you can't vote before 1 p.m. on Sunday seems so hyper targeted to stop black Christians from organizing immediately after church that they're the religious party, right? It's us godless atheists who are always cracking down on Christianity and everything. Yeah, I mean, it is so racist from that angle, you know, knowing that, you know, a lot of the get out the vote efforts in Texas um, with the black community, yeah, has focuses around, you know, going out after church. I mean, they might as well be like, and if you're wearing a hat that is higher than two inches, no, <laughs> sorry, you can't vote, you know, but also, You know, and like all of these voter suppression bills, yes, they disproportionately target people of color for sure, but they also target like white Texans who also go vote after church. You know what I mean? Like that is a thing as well. And they, you know, and Republicans know this. They know that mail in like ending or restricting mail in voting also disproportionately affects older folks who might be more conservative. They don't care. They're like, no, we can see the thing is, we can get by on minority rule and we like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've apparently decided that, I mean, every voter suppression effort basically that the Republicans um, ever pursue will hurt some Republicans and Republican voters are seemingly okay with that. Um, mm-hmm. Either because of ignorance or because they get at the end of the day, them ruling is more important than their party giving a damn about them voting. Um, but they've apparently decided that uh, white conservative Texans vote at uh, predictable levels. It's America, so the levels are still pathetic, but they do vote. Um, other voters vote at lower levels. There's a little bit more apathy, perhaps because the system does stuff like this to them constantly. <laughs> and so they need a little bit more activism, effort, get out the vote, that sort of thing. And so, yeah, there's going to be some white Christians that probably would have benefited from uh, easier voting. There's definitely older people that would have loved having their mail in ballots sent to them without them having to jump through bureaucratic hoops. But uh, you live in Texas, so screw you. That's basically how your party thinks about you. Yeah. But let's just, we're gonna go back to how the bill is scary and how it's probably gonna pass. But Francesca, the Democrats stopped it briefly. So what what do you say to that? I mean, it's incredible, I, I, right? Like to see them actually working together. There's like, who's the Joe Manchin of the Texas state <laughs> legislature who's like, no, nah, I don't think so. Um, you know, we gotta restore dignity. Like, who? <laughs> Apparently, there isn't one. You know, and like, it's like, let, let me go on ABC News to talk about how we need to restore. It. Okay, let me go on MSNBC. Let me go on CNN. Like, like, no. It, it is nice to see Democrats working together. And if not for this. Then you gotta ask yourself for what? We're talking about a completely anti democratic measure that is taking us backwards in time when it comes to voting rights. This is the foundation of democracy, 
voting. And it worked pretty damn well in 2020 in terms of turnout, right? I mean, you can talk about who won, but also talking about the massive turnout, which again, because we're not stupid, we link those two things and Republicans aren't either. They know that turnout means they're gonna be losing. But it is nice to see there, there's no Kristen Cinema who's like, you know, I'm gonna curtsy and no to this. So mm -hmm. you hope it continues and also, you got to look at the when, like when Republicans have walked out of state legislatures, like Oregon, I think their Republican state legislature has walked out like three times now. One over, you know, minimal restrictions to firearms, another over COVID safety precautions. They do it all the time. They have like mm -hmm. a meeting spot where they go and are just like, you know, we're upholding them, like we're stopping the process here because phooey. Yeah. Um, and they do it over terrible things. So it's nice to see Republican, it's nice to see Democrats utilizing the tools that Republicans always utilize, but for good. Yeah, yeah, and it would be great to see some of those senators that you referenced, I don't know, to be inspired perhaps a little bit like this. Like, you know, they're they're doing every tactic they can in Texas to hold this off. And like Manchin's like, eh, I bet I can find some Republicans that'll do something bipartisan-y with me. Kristen Cinema can't even show up for the vote to establish the January 6th commission. <sighs> anyway, um, now that said, the governor of Texas has responded to Democrats walking out and stopping him from getting his bill that would make voting effectively not count for anything in Texas. He tweeted, election integrity and bail reform were emergency items for this legislative session. They still must pass. Now hold on, let's pause for a second there. Election integrity emergency items. Like Trump won in Texas. Like they, they still, the Republicans still won. emergency. <laughs> it's an emergency. People voted no. And as our producers pointed out, he's going to call for a special session, which he did not do for Hurricane Harvey, multiple mass shootings, or I don't know, the pandemic. Those not so much emergencies. But some black voters in Houston voting, everybody get to the Capitol stat. That's an emergency, okay. Legislators will be expected to have worked out the details when they arrive at the Capitol for the special session. I get it, like if you're having people over, you don't wanna be arguing about what food to get like when they get here, you should work it out ahead of time. But like this is, this is, but the thing is we're joking. It is an emergency to them, Hurricane Harvey happening. That fits with their view of the world. It wrecks some poor people's lives, whatever. Some mass shootings happen, doesn't affect Greg Abbott. He doesn't care about that. People starting to vote, having a little bit easier time to vote. That is actually an emergency for them. There are only two things across the country that seemingly count as emergencies. One is a sort of like, you know, Existential threat to their ability to maintain power. The other is their need to keep their base worked up. They are trying to stop people from voting and they're trying to stop the transgender community from participating in sports. Those are the two emergencies that the Republican mm -hmm. Party is currently facing. And that is why their bills are focused on those two things. So, Francesca, we were happy to see the Democrats win, but maybe with this special session, it won't be, it won't last that long. Yeah. And, you know, and and they could use help. Democrats could use help from senators, you know, and from on the federal level. And like passing HR one in the Senate is going to be huge, right? And getting like protecting voting rights, enshrining them, so we don't have, you know, so we don't address voting rights the way we did COVID, which was mm -hmm. piecemeal, on off, wear a mask on, you know, Temporary. Tuesdays, but not on Wednesdays. Exactly. Like, and and then you've got different spreads uh, all over the country. I mean, that's essentially the state's rights origin of this country, which it once again rooted in a lot of racism um, and rooted in who wanted to keep slavery, etc. Uh, so it is sad we have to refight these fights, but this is the Republicans have shown their hands so clear that this is what they're hell bent on that that even when we've talked about this before, they don't even say democracy anymore. Democracy is actually kind of a bad word if you're a Republican and you're on the right. You call you call it a republic, you call America a republic as if those two things are different. They're actually the same thing, but somehow in your mind, they're not. Um, and you, you know, they're sort of floating this new theory that, you know, when all people vote, less people vote. 
Mm-hmm. And you're like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More people, less democracy. You're like, huh? Mm hmm. Anyway, uh, keep on reading old Dr. Seuss and uh, we'll be fine. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, gotta go. Like, they are, they don't explain it, but, it, you know, we all know that this is what their aim is. So, I don't know. Yeah. John, you think <laughs> I'm looking at Beto O'Rourke trying to like make a little bit of a, a uh. comeback? <laughs> I'm more of a Joaquin uh. Castro <laughs> girl myself. I, I don't know. I a mean, Joaquin and a Julian together. Tandem. To get, can two people run together? Like, is is Beto gonna jump up onto our democracy and then <laughs> stand on it and save us? I don't know. Maybe. Look, if he's the candidate, good, good, I guess. But I don't know. It's just the, what about the whole his thing is dog. I love every photo of Beto. His dog is always in the corner. He's got a black lab who's just like, oh. He's like, <laughs> I you're not, not, really you're not gonna win. <laughs> like, just <laughs> look at these photos of his dog. Very sad. Very, very like knows very that Beto sad. might not be the guy, but who knows? I don't know. And and who knows you better <laughs> than your dog? Anyway, I guess I guess we'll wait and see. I don't know. It's just that the the Republican Party has for a very long time understood far better how power works than the Democratic Party does. The Democratic Party does better than you might. Think you just have to understand what they use their power towards, and inaction can be a very effective tool. Um, that said, they're getting what they want, and they get that their their base doesn't give a damn about democracy. They're not interested in that. They want people who they trust, whether they should trust them or not, to be in charge, to rule. That's what they have, and the Republican Party thinks that either permanently or at least for a while. The other way is that the system is manipulated to allow a small minority to maintain majority control of you know, the bulk of the political power in the country. That is going to slow down reforms and it's it's working pretty well for them. And one way to continue that is making it really, really hard to vote, which sure that affects presidential elections and it affects uh, you know like choosing your congressman and stuff like that. But it also helps you maintain Republican governorship in Texas. It also helps you maintain a Republican state legislator, um, legislature, I should say. So it's a pretty good strategy. Hopefully, the Democrats will continue to take it seriously. But them taking it seriously in Texas is not enough. They have to do it nationally too. And Francesco is talking about HR one. Um, you know, Manchin doesn't even support it. Like he yeah. does not support that. Like as of right now, it can't pass. So, and that's even if you know. They were to to get rid of the the filibuster. So, I mean, and the the other thing that happens, right? Yeah, and the other thing, I mean, correct me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like also in a lot of state legislatures, when Democrats pull these things, um, Republicans are like, okay, cool, we're just going to rewrite the rules. Like we won't, we don't need. It's entirely possible they might do that with the legislature. Sure, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that's why those those things about like. Oh, Democrats don't make even minor reforms of the filibuster because then Mitch McConnell will do. No, he will do literally whatever he needs to do to get done what he wants to get done. That is what he will do. That is what he has always done. That is what they always do. Like we we talk about like oh maybe Beto will win. Okay, if Beto wins the governorship, I can I, I can tell you what the next couple chapters of that political story are. The Republican governor is gonna have a lot less power about two weeks after that election's done because that's what they do. Right. Republican state legislatures strip all of the power away from all of the executive, the state level executive branch offices, the Democrats win. They've done it in multiple states already, they're gonna continue to do that. Whatever power they have will be used to maintain whatever power they need to hold on to. That's what it's gonna be. And by the way, like legislatures are one thing, the Supreme Court's a pretty big one. You know, and we're we're like hoping like maybe they can pass voting reform at the national level. Okay, good. And hopefully it will last with a conservative supermajority in the Supreme Court that understands the political calculations. We'll John, see. We'll see. You you studied you sound like you studied poli sci. So I have a question. <laughs> uh-huh. Um no, but in terms of a state's constitution, mm-hmm. can you make an amendment or like how 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 important are our state's constitution? Do we have them? Are they like what is they're there? Are they like <laughs> replicas and they're like California's version? Do you know what I mean? Like can we add is there an amendment you can say you can't rewrite the rules, <laughs> you know, to like strip authority um, from the incoming governor? I mean, you you could potentially. Well, first of all, it, you'd have to see the individual state you're talking about because every state constitution is different. You could in theory 
I guess have some sort of general guidelines of what the legislatures can do. I don't know. I don't know, honestly. Yeah. It would depend on the individual states. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, it's okay. I'll and good get, luck get passing a constitutional amendment in the states <laughs> where they control the state government enough to, to the point where they could strip a governor of his power. <laughs> or or strip, you know, like in Georgia, like strip, you know, the incoming secretaries of state. And the you know the board that controls the election stripped them of their power and yes. handed over to some partisan group. It's not just the governor, anyway. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a lot of other news, including by the way, a couple bits of good news on the rundown today. But before we get to that, let's see what's going on off in the audience with our first super chat coming from Peter Hamby, who says, "Sorry, Francesca, but it is John Iderola on the Damage Reports show torching Republicans before lunch." Thank you. It is, but I don't know. I enjoyed watching Francesca <sighs> taking the lead. I accept. I would wake up in the morning. I'd drive to IKEA on the road, pop on a little bit for of the, the show. It was fun for the tenth time. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to IKEA four times in the last <laughs> two weeks. I finally got the chair I wanted. Anyway, I won't regale you with that unnecessarily long story, but I did finally get my chair. Anyway, uh, Rob Shively says, "Rejoice for Dragon Daddy and Dragon Mommy are together again. Platonic parenting inferred." Even Ooh. that I think is probably mushing us too close together, but thank you, Rob. I'm excited to be back on with Francesca as well. Yeah, no, we're, no, I like that. We're like co-parents for, I mean, on, on some days, which is kind of the parenting I love. Like only have the kid one day and then like <laughs> the dad takes them the rest, like love it. Oh mm. my God, mom goes to brunch, it's great. <laughs> uh, let's see, Smiling Turtle Dragon says, thank you kindly for following through on my request for a Rainbow Dragon Squad t-shirt. Mine has now been ordered. Happy pride to all of you at TDR and TYT, love ya. Thank you, I know that that had been very high on the list of requests. And no, it's here, shoptyt.com. Sierra says, America being America again, I hate when that happens. Yes, it is unfortunately one of the most reliable things about America. Isn't that sad? Uh, let's see, Richard Rowe for Congress says, hey John, I'm about 20 minutes behind. If you need an editor for your book, I was section editor at Demand Media for eight years, hit me up. Thank you, I am way far away from the point of even needing an editor, but that's very nice of you. I'll keep everyone apprised. Um, let's see, Hammer Dan says maybe, and this is on the TYT.com member section. Uh, maybe we could all appeal to Republican sense of decency to quote Kenneth Copeland, <laughs> his crazy <laughs> demon laugh. <laughs> I'm not inhabited by males above. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Unfortunately, that's actually what Joe Manchin says. So the joke's on us. Over on Twitch, Samuel and the Kind Dragon gifted five tier one subs, as did the blue, the real blue tech. Give no gifted ten tier one subs. Man, Super Subs Day continues. Uh, Senna Sherabo Flight gifted five. Thank you so much. Megan X Solo gifted uh, one two. The Artsy Fartsy Dragon gifted five tier one subs in Calico mode. Yeah, gifted one as well. Thank you to all of you. Great to see the community continuing to grow. Uh, let's see, we have some uh, subscribers as well. Jordani hits six months. Tree Boba Tiki, hey, Tree says, uh, hits 11 months. It says, Happy Fantastic Tuesday, Dragons. Thank you for that. Great to see. Let's see. Uh, Kyokin says, Hey, guy, wanted to say hi. I'm currently watching from my hotel room TV, so I won't be in chat. Hope everyone has a good day. Well, look at that. A little travel going on. Hope it's a nice little hotel room. <laughs> Civic Folly says, Joe Manchin is one bad night away from becoming Grandpa Monster without the cape. <laughs> I get, that might be an improvement. Maybe we should maybe we should work towards that. Uh, but with that, I think after that story, Francesca, I think we need a little bit of good news. So why don't we turn to that? Do it. Okay. <laughs> Pictures. We have Ken Klippenstein B roll. I'm shocked <laughs> to find out we have. Do we have no, no, no. We want prom <laughs> photos. We want old headshots. <laughs> no, I want Ken with hey. like the lasers background behind him. That's what I want. Anyway, that's Ken Klippenstein. And Ken Klippenstein, he is a fan of tradition. And on Memorial Day, he has a tradition. And every year, he strikes again. Back in 2019, he tricked former Representative Steve King into wishing a happy Independence Day to his uncle, fictional Marine Colonel Nathan <laughs> Jessup from A Few Good Men. That's a classic. <laughs> and then, for good measure, changed his Twitter name to Steve King is a white supremacist, so that phrase would show up on the congressman's page. In 2020, he fooled former acting director of national intelligence, Richard Grinnell, into bidding a happy Veterans Day to his grandpa, Bill Callie, the war criminal behind the My Lai massacre. Well, 
what about this year? What is he gonna do? Well, there's been a theme to the people he's gotten them to retweet, and he was quite successful. For instance, Matt Gates responded to Ken Klippenstein. Oh, sorry, his name on Twitter is Matt Gates is a pedo, who had a, a tweet that said, Congressman, my grandpa's a big fan of yours and is a veteran. He would be thrilled if you could retweet this photo of him for Memorial Day. Here he is, a young private first class. <laughs> and that, if you don't recognize the face, is Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who assassinated John F. Kennedy, also former Marine. That is, in fact, his military portrait. And Matt Gates did retweet it with an American flag and the phrase Matt Gates is a pedo showing up on his timeline, which he would rapidly delete after that. Uh, Matt Schlapp also uh, retweeted, says it's my honor to retweet, retweet the photo of a veteran on a day we remember his fallen friends, which is just too much. His <laughs> fallen friends. Oh my and God. Enemies. You got schlapped. You got schlapped. Um, and so look, he, there, there's multiple layers to this that we're gonna turn to, but I, I don't know, like it's a little thing, it's a little bit of trolling. But to me, it just really like solidifies, they don't actually care about this. Like no. it's, it's just, it's just performative. Like, yeah, 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 it's a veteran. I want to pretend that I care about veterans or whatever. I'll leave them to die in the Middle East or whatever. I don't care if they die by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. But on this day, you send me a picture of a guy with a camo hat on, I'm gonna retweet it for you. That is the Matt Gates guarantee. It's more than that though, because there's a caveat. And the caveat, and you always have to say this, is he is a big fan of yours. Like, seriously, just the yeah. most like yeah. fragile, egocentric people, right? They just, oh, they, and if you say anything, you're like, so anyway, um, I'm a huge fan, and after I got done murdering five people, uh, I just like took to your <laughs> Facebook page and I just liked everything because I love everything you post. And yeah. they'll be like, "Oh my God, freedom!" You know, like that is the level. They're like, "Look, I'm a stand-up comic. I know what it is to want applause, to want just like <laughs> random congratulations." If someone says like, "I'm a big fan," you're like, "I'm listening." What you want me to endorse? <laughs> you know, like what? Granola, like I don't know, like whatever, like you know. But even me, so to me, it's that it's the it's the sycophantry, right? You can get anything if you're just a sycophant with Say these guys. You're it yeah. doesn't with Trump. It with was Grand one Tarkin. Doesn't matter. Look, Trump is a white supremacist, so let's all remember that. But also, he didn't in part denounce David Duke, and he doesn't denounce QAnon because he's like, well, they're my fans. Yeah. And I don't denounce fans, you know. And mm -hmm. you're like, no, man, you obviously you should. The other part of this is I didn't know this was Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. I don't honestly have a photographic memory of him in my brain. Maybe that's on me. I would have definitely checked had it been me, but also I'm not a, a Congress person. Like I do, <laughs> I am not num. Like I'm not first in my American history class. You know what I'm saying? But you would imagine that maybe Congress people and people who proclaim to love America and defend it from terrorists and blah, 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 you you'd yeah. think maybe they would have known. Sure, and look, and maybe that's expecting too much. Maybe you couldn't recognize him from that photo. But you know who you should recognize on Twitter. Ken Klippenstein, <laughs> the dude has not logged off in seven years and you don't recognize this is his thing, you fools. He's gonna get you, he's gonna get you. <laughs> as um, I'm blanking on the name now, despite having watched Breaking Bad recently, as he said, he can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> Ken does keep getting away with it. Now that said, while it might be a bit too much to expect for them to recognize the picture, I don't know, like once you know what is going on, I think we could have a bit higher expectations. And yet, Ken Klippenstein, in addition to getting a number of high profile Republicans to retweet an image of Lee Harvey Oswald, also caused Candace Owens to self destruct because she saw it. She retweeted Ken retweeting, hmm, that's weird to Lee Harvey Oswald trending. Uh, and said, you are making a mockery of a day that is meant to memorialize men that died. So that you and other anti-American leftists can laugh at their sacrifices by photoshopping a murderer into their uniforms. You are deranged. 
as is any person applauding your efforts. Well, first off, bit of a fact check. Uh, he didn't Photoshop anybody. The RV was Oswald was a Marine. He was actually a soldier. This is gonna blow your mind, Candace. But there have been soldiers who've killed people. And sometimes it's not the people that socially we've said it's cool for them to kill. <laughs> sometimes they come back and they shoot up people here. That happens actually. So her history again, like they, they didn't recognize the picture, Francesca, but she knew exactly who he was talking about and either didn't know or seeks to pretend that no soldier has ever been um, you know, willing to do something insane. Now that said, here is the new angle. And it's hmm. the political correctness angle. He responds, would not have guessed you cared so much about being politically correct. And she said, it is not political correctness to have a soul and a modicum of decency. Well, hold on, let's pause there. That that seems like exactly what the stereotypical invocation of political correctness is about. Yes. It's about yes. decency or whatever. So do you desire it or do you not? Because he is not. Like it's one thing maybe if you're expressing an honestly held belief that someone finds abhorrent. Ken definitely doesn't actually love Lee Harvey Oswald. This is a joke. You cannot like the joke or like it. You can laugh or you can not laugh, but he's definitely joking. And I'm not the one who made our national conversation about political correctness and cancel culture like 80% about what comedians can do. Yep. They did that. Yep. They every single right wing comedian has a special called triggered or whatever at this point. <laughs> so so true. can you joke about stuff that's politically incorrect or can you not? Francesca, you're a comedian. Answer for them. Oh my god, I'm not gonna answer for like boomer comics who are fading from glory, who aren't smart or creative enough to write better material. Um, their jokes are aging. But this is you're exactly right when you talk about. Yeah, political correctness is just having a certain amount of decorum. It's just not, it's actually trying to respect people a little bit. You know, whether or not it's what pronoun they prefer to be used, whether it's, you know, uh, understanding like their histories and legacies of racial oppression. Uh, I don't know. It's the same thing as someone's family member dies, having a little bit of respect and like, Saying you're sorry and you know how's it going? Like li like li literally. But when it comes to the troops, when it comes to the troops, when and the right, it is blind allegiance and loyalty. They can do no wrong, and they are 150% perfect because our American military is perfect. Everything we've ever done, the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, untold civilian deaths. No, that is perfectly fine. You know, and that is that is what the left and progressives, what we call BS on. We call BS on having a military that is beyond critique. And soldiers themselves call BS on that. Why? Because that culture of we can never critique the military puts them in danger because it promotes idiots and a-holes who shouldn't be there, who are sending them into danger strategically, as well as it promotes rapists and assaulters inside the military when someone is being abused yeah. and abusing others at, you know, and on, on bases in so many instances. And finally, you know, Ken's Ken's joke was that exactly that. It was a joke and it's funny. But man, there is a tinge of sorrow to that because you realize, you know, this is whatever, 50 years ago when JFK is assassinated, and that was a Marine, and yet we still have untold numbers of servicemen and women coming back, extreme PTSD, people yep. who've been radicalized by the military, who've been even more um sort of convinced of some sort of like, you know, grand conspiracy or terrorism is everywhere, Sharia law. You look at the number of servicemen, former servicemen and women who were stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Yep. The military and has cops. a problem and police officers, and we know this. And so once again, it's not unpatriotic to say we can do better. And it's not unpatriotic to criticize wars we should have never been in the first place. And my God, veterans have been leading the way on this for so long. And get the f out of here! You don't give, you do not care about veterans because yeah. you don't take care of them, and you step over them if they ever would ask you for money in the streets. Mm. Exactly. No. And look, his joke bothers them infinitely more than actual 
whether it's an honest belief, it is presented as an honest belief about the military from people like Tucker Carlson, who did segments mocking the fact that you would have a pregnant woman serving in the military, that that makes a mockery of the military. That was not presented as a joke. I don't know that he believes it because that means that he actually thinks about politics and then expresses the thoughts. I don't think he puts that much into it, but he said it on his news show when Ted Cruz is like, "Oh, they're doing political, they're doing ads for the military where like they talk about diversity and stuff." That that's feminization of the military. That's not a joke. He's actually saying having people like this serving in our military makes us weaker. So where's Candace Owens' anger about that? No, it's the yeah. joke that does it. Candace Owens. Who would have you believe that like if you were to burrow into her chest, you'd just find a beating heart love for free speech. No, she likes in the same way that literally everyone does some speech and not other speech. Now that is true, but it's not good for branding. And so they've come up with things like political correctness and cancel culture. Which means that they get to say they're for all speech when not being for it. And anything the left has a problem with is fundamentally some sort of problem of them canceling stuff and being censorious or whatever. Now, Ken pointed that out to her saying, (laughs) I for one believe in free speech. Of course, at that point, she had either deleted her tweets or had blocked him. She did later actually block him, despite, by the way, she brought herself into this by quote retweeting him. He didn't target her. Oh, yeah. He pointed out funny how elastic the concept of political correctness is to her comment. And so I will just reiterate, you can do one of a couple of different things. You can have an actual standard about political speech and stick to it. That's almost purely a hypothetical because nobody basically has that. Or you can do what I have is have no standard, but not pretend to. What she does and what virtually everyone on the right does is pretend to have a standard that you never actually have to stick to. What I would say is, let's do what actually occurs in reality that the conversations about political correctness and cancel culture seek to obscure, which is everybody gets to say and do stuff and you get to respond to it. If you like it, clap or subscribe or whatever. If you don't, ignore the person or speak out against it. Right. That is the only way any of this can work. But they pretend that they have found something better, more pure, loftier, superior in some way. No, no, it's what it is. Listen to something somebody says, and if you don't like it, ignore it or speak out against it. If they're selling a product and you don't like it, don't buy it. Or maybe say other people shouldn't buy it. That's the only way any of this can actually work in practice. It's it's the rules apply to you and not to me. It's okay when I do it. I did an entire video on Newsbroke about Trump's it's okay when I do it. Literally, like you don't have to talk about political correctness or cancel culture. It's just it's okay when I do it, right? So if Ilhan Omar says something that someone might interpret as anti-Semitic, Megan McCain goes crazy. Oh my God, I blah, blah, blah. Marjorie Taylor Greene says something, you know, she's crazy. It doesn't matter what she says. She's not relevant. Why would she apologize? That's not anti-Semitic, right? It's the same standard. Feminism, oh my God. Oh, women are, shouldn't be victims. Why are you allowing yourself to be victimized? You know, all these pussy-headed feminists, they're just victims. And then if you say, Anything about Sarah Huckabee Sanders, you make a joke about her eye makeup. Oh my God, she's a woman in a high place. And like, it's just okay (laughs) when I do it, when they do it. And we see this time and time again. The jokes, exactly. I'm not even sure Candace Owens understood the joke. We've, you went over that. It's not a photoshopped image. But even if she did, it's like she just said, it's not okay to joke about veterans. Oh, You're the one who's saying literally comics are being canceled because they can't joke about trans people or mm-hmm. black people or homeless people or all the other people who generally don't wield power in the society, right? But when it comes to veterans who we false claim to love, no, oh, then there's a line crossed. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Ah, Ken Klippenstein, good job. <laughs> and I, you know, I, he's gonna come for me someday. I know the wheel spins, <laughs> and someday you will be the target of this Twitter assassin. So I've had a good run. We'll see what happens when he finally comes for me. Anyway, um, but he's he's okay. the Sasha guys. He's the Sasha Baron Cohen of Twitter. 
Like if you get Basically. duped by Ken <laughs> Klippenstein at this point, you're an idiot. Like mm -hmm. haven't you seen Ali G and haven't you seen Borat? Like you at this point, you know? Yeah. And yeah. he just like all 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 any of them would ever have to do is click on his profile cuz he sends the same message to 10 people. You'd <laughs> see it like they just they don't do the minimum work. <laughs> <sighs> It would be like, like you you look down, you see a red dot on your chest. You don't even dodge. That's all I'm asking. Just dodge. If you get shot at that point, it's probably on you. Anyway, um, okay. So, uh, a couple super chats. I think we're we're running out of time pretty rapidly, actually. So these next few stories, we're gonna have to cruise through. I can tell that Sophie's frustrated with me. Uh, Andar says, Happy Pride Month, all my fellow queer and trans progressives. I love Swedish sativa dragon. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, Sleeper Service says, did you see Tucker's unaired and expletive ridden phone interview with Dutch historian Rutger Bregman? If you're talking about the one from a couple of years ago, I did. I don't, did he have him back on? I don't even know that he aired the first one. Um, okay, Christopher says, Afghan veteran here. Who the hell decided that Republicans and the right are the party of patriotism? Uh, well, the Republicans yeah. did and the media and kind of the Democrats, I, they all sort of conspired to make the Republicans the party of whatever is good. I don't know. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Let's jump right into this next story. Speaking of soldiers that have caused some problems after they've come back, General Michael Flynn, <laughs> formerly of the White House, formerly general, um, had some thoughts about how the American government can be put right from his perspective. Here he is just this last Sunday in Dallas. I'm a simple Marine. I want to know why what happened in Minamar can't happen here. <laughs> you know. No reason. I mean, it, it should have it. No reason. But that's right. One more. Okay. So, um, Minamar, <laughs> Francesca, <laughs> the situation in Minamar that definitely is. I mean, that's a that's a tense subject. Talk about this country Look, that he totally knows a lot about. John, don't minimize the situation in Minamar. <laughs> okay. I've done a Minamar amount of research into this, and I can <laughs> confidently say. Anyway, so that wasn't that wasn't Flynn with the Minamar, but he did say that uh, that the, the the coup that took down their democratically elected government should and could happen here. And he is, I don't know if it needs to be said, it's in his title, a former general of our military, a steadfast supporter of Donald Trump, who tried to stay in office despite losing an election. I don't believe that he holds any influence over the military or anything, but it seems significant that a former general is going around to Q conventions and things like that and calling for the overthrow of our democratically elected government. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is where he gets a lot of his cred from the QAnon crazies is because he was a general. Yeah, yeah, he had to register as a foreign agent and you know, he was working on behalf of the Ukrainian government and in part the Russian government. He was basically like a mercenary for the, you know, whoever would give him the most amount of money. That doesn't matter. No, no, no. Patriot, patriot, not not a Russian patriot, no, no American patriot. Um and yeah, I mean, Myanmar, what happened is Aung San Suu Kyi is, I believe, still under house arrest right now. Mm -hmm. The military took over and and like the and the military who she arguably let slide for way too long sure. when it came to atrocities against a minority Muslim community there. But and yeah, so it's scary stuff. I mean, this is the QAnon folks and 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 Flynn has been participating in this. And you know, even Mike Lindell from My Pillow have been participating in the idea of like, hey, what if we just take the reins of power? And absolutely, you bet that the lesson a lot of people are drawing from 2020 is they should have. That the military just should have been on board. Mm -hmm. And then they tried yeah. to, and then they tried to on January 6th. <laughs> like, uh, let, let us and not forget. 
And the only people that have suffered any significant consequences are the, you know, the foot soldiers they sent running into the into the building. That's it. Like yeah. none of the people who organized it have suffered any consequences. Um, you know, and by directly organized it or called for it effectively. So he's off giving his speeches. Um Sidney Powell was at, I believe, that event. Saying that Donald Trump will be president again, which apparently Trump is also saying that he'll be president by August. Um, that ah, you know, it's unfortunate that he doesn't get penalty time for the months Joe Biden stole from him, but he's definitely going to be president again. Uh, Rudy Giuliani still exists. Trump, it's just out there. Like he's facing this criminal investigation, but not for trying to overthrow the U.S. government. And he might run again. He might try to. You know, steal an election again. Like they tried to do this in a number of different forms, and only the weakest of all of them are suffering any consequences whatsoever. All of the leaders of it are still out there. They've learned some lessons. They haven't repented. They haven't had to apologize for any of this. They're waiting for round two. And we're supposed to just be like, oh, that's cool. Don't worry. We have our great defenders, Joe Biden and Joe Manchin, and all that. They'll definitely save democracy. Absolutely. I know we have a million stories to get to, John. So yes, I'm gonna sure. let you just end on so, that note. One more note. Stick like, the landing. Keep going. The the Ken Clippenstein thing that that bothers you because he's mocking the troops, but Flynn saying, "Oh no, what should happen is our soldiers should turn against the commander in chief, turn against the Constitution, and then turn us into some tin pot dictatorship by overthrowing the government." Is a general saying that about soldiers, not a people. That's that's not you know a day before Memorial Day. That's not an issue. That's not an insult to the soldiers. To be fair, that is right. super American, right? I mean, we love installing tin pot dictators, so it just yeah. made sense that we did it in this country. Yeah, um, potentially, potentially with some foreign help, which is just even more on brand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the last, it's cultural appropriation come to democratic overthrow. Uh-huh. Anyway, let's turn to some other news. <clears throat> oh, I love that B roll already. Over the past few years, we've gotten some good Democrats elected, generally being represented as part of the Justice Democrats, but more appear to be coming, and their odds certainly aren't looking that bad. Uh, one, Nina Turner. You might have seen her on the show many, many times. Um, She's running for the seat that was vacated when former Representative Marsha Fudge was tapped by President Joe Biden to serve as the US Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And uh, they've got this special Democratic primary coming up in not that long. Well, we got a poll. Let's take a look at this. And that is what you Mm. want that poll to look like right now with Nina Turner at 50%. The second place, I mean, other than undecided, I guess, being a candidate Brown at 15%. It falls off rapidly after that point. That is, a pr- I mean, look, I'm obviously a huge fan of Nina Turner. I'm never more hyped for life than in the immediate aftermath of having talked to her on the program. But I didn't <laughs> dare dream that at this point she'd be at 50%. That seems pretty good. Absolutely. Wait, I was. I was looking at the poll and I was like, wow, that that und candidate is really <laughs> surging though. 20% of Mr. Und or Mrs. Und. That's undecided, obviously. I'm an idiot. Um, 50% is amazing, especially at this point um, to have that many voting for. I mean, she's gonna crush it, right? Like unless the unless they can org like other Democrats in opposition can coalesce around one person, which you never know. Barack Obama might make a magic call, and <laughs> uh, you know it, yeah. we'll get a we'll get a Biden-like figure against her. Um, I'd be so mad if he ever did something like that. But look, Nina Turner deserves to be in the House. She she, you know, if anyone's ever seen her speak, seen her at a rally, seen her on television where she just slays every single time, courage of her convictions, and and truly, you know, speaking to I think. Working class and also, you know, Black Americans' needs, you know, and by also prioritizing 
what consistently when polled they also they discuss which is in addition to racial justice, healthcare and housing and and climate justice, some of the most basic sort of, you know, quality of life things. Yeah. Um so wow, what a gift for Ohio and for this country if this actually happens. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And uh I mean, if they were to get all of the other candidates and if the uns Broke for them, and I did check. It is undecided. It's not Francis Underwood, thankfully. <laughs> um, broke for her, but I, I do want you to bear in mind this: it's a poll. Who knows? When we showed you, and you, probably most of the people watching this probably saw the poll going around on Twitter. But uh, whether you saw it there or you saw it here for the first time, think about how you felt. Pretty good, right? It was nice. The idea that Nina Turner could be Congresswoman Nina Turner. Okay. Now think about what if it doesn't happen? Think about how you're gonna feel and understand that a poll is good, but a poll ain't destiny. So there's two objectives to doing this story. The first is, oh, a good feeling, isn't that rare? Yes, that is nice. The second though is, now make it happen. And like she's doing well with the, the volunteers that she's gotten, the don't the donors to her campaign, all of that. But she's going to need more because while a lot of people are going to feel great watching this poll, her opponents in the Democratic establishment, they're going to see this and think, "Oh, we need to flood money into this race yep. to try to tear her apart, to try to boost one of her opponents. Maybe we're going to get some of the others to drop out. So this is, it's not done. She's going to need help. She's going to need donors. She's going to need people to make calls. Yes. Um, you know, we're, if it's safe in the area with masks and everything to go knock on doors. So go check her out. We've had her on the show multiple times during the race. We're gonna have her back on again. Just bear that in mind. Poll's great, it's looking good, it ain't done yet. So just bear that in mind. Okay, now with that, I'm gonna read a couple quick super chats and then we're gonna launch into something slightly more depressing actually. <laughs> so let's see, anyway. Um, Non-human humanist says 30 to 40s Germany, a failed artist dodges the draft, ghostwriter helped to write his memoir, tries coup, fails, tries again, US, no more parallels, please. Oh God. Yes, I, I get what you're saying there, <laughs> yes. Um, Riley Jones says there's enough bad news, John, let's hear about that chair. <laughs> Nobody cares about it. <laughs> I had to go to a far away Ikea and I got the last one. That's basically the end of this story. It's the only one in Southern California. Did you so trample an elderly woman to get it? I didn't, show. but I didn't have to. What would I have done? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Want that chair. Puka Dragon says, just ordered rainbow t-shirt. I've been holding out for purple. Francesca was fabulous last week. When is TYT giving her a show? Glad you're back. I. Have a show. It's called the Bituation Room Podcast, and you should you listen and and watch it. We're gonna do a special episode tomorrow, actually, tomorrow Wednesday, randomly at five o'clock. So definitely go to Franny Fio on YouTube for that, and then every other Sunday, 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 Sunday yeah. at five eight Eastern. Yeah, <laughs> everybody knows about the Bituation Room, right? They know about News Broke. Just I understand. Me. I I love the idea of of Francesca having a show on our network too, but she does have shows. You should definitely be watching this. Okay, uh, Lawrence Wells says, hey dragons, went to a wedding last weekend in Southwest England. Visit if you get a chance, try Cornish pasty and the local ice cream, but remember sunblock. By the way, pundits like Owens are such censorious rexes. Okay, that's funny. Uh, a Cornish pasty and some ice cream sounds delightful. I've never been to uh, the UK. A like Cornish to. pastry and a, a nice, what is it? <laughs> A uh, local ice cream. A local ice cream, a Cornish pastry. <laughs> you have to say it like that. I don't know. Is that Welsh? Sorry. I'm no. I already got in trouble with the Welsh in the pre-show. <laughs> let's not. Let's not anchor. Oh, them let's make it a <laughs> tomorrow Welsh bashing Wednesday. That's tomorrow. No. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm having a little bit of lighting problems. If it all of a sudden is dark in here, <laughs> apologies in advance. It's flickering. I don't know. Are the Welsh in control of the electricity? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so in the Twitch section, Bart says, hey, John, my granddad was an officer and did his duty. Unfortunately, he died on the field of battle. My last conversation with him was when he told me he was a big fan of yours. Could you send him a big shout out for him in remembrance for post Memorial Day? And it's a picture of Grand Moff Tarkin from Star Wars. <laughs> Thank you, Bart. <laughs> he died on the, in his moment of triumph. Anyway, 
Z Huddle gifted a tier one sub over on Twitch. Thank you for that. BC Trumpet gifted five, and Brandy Lou two gifted one as well. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for holding the human for subscribing for the ninth month. Says hope to see you at Gen Con. I hope to be at Gen Con. We'll we'll see about that. Tempo Dan subscribed for six months. Says John may be younger than I by a year, but he's who I want to be when I grow up. Well, thank you, thank you. I've said the same thing about Greta in the past, actually. Anyway, um, there was a lot of people talking about Minimar and Minibar <laughs> in the Twitch <laughs> chat. <laughs> we need to have military takeover of the Minibar and the Cinnabar. Um, anyway, Snowflake Warrior 2020, subscribe for six months. Says love your content, keep up the good work, Dragon Squad. Thank you very much. And finally, Edwin subscribed for three months. It says, Francesca, you make my Mondays, now Tuesday, better. Happy to see Daddy, Daddy Dragon and Mommy Dragon back together. But wait, did you have a name. You you referenced it last week. What was it? Well, it was Evil Stepsister Dragon, yes. but that was just because it was a little bit of a takeover. You know, it was like Angelica from Rugrats, you know, taking Tommy's toys. Like that's mm -hmm. the vibe. But I don't really like that name. I do like Fantastic Dragon because it's but it's very basic, but I do like, I like it. That. Let's let's stick with that. You know what? Okay. And uh, by the way, I probably should give this heads up before doing the chat. But you know what? We're gonna leave the E block for we we have to do a top ten list, so we don't have much time. We're gonna skip the E block for now. We're gonna go right to the F block because oh. it's bananas. Oh yeah. And so I would this have been on the rundown if not for Francesca? I don't know. Maybe we'll see. But I had to have her mm. here. Okay, with that, let's jump to this. <clears throat> I, you know, I was gonna sort of try to hide the identity of the person in this story, but the B-roll is gonna make that a little bit more <laughs> difficult. So Ellie Kemper's back in the news, well that's great. I loved Ellie Kemper in the office. I thought the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was amazing. And now I find out that she's in the news for, oh no, oh God, no. <laughs> well, let's take a look at why she's in the news. So as a freshman at Princeton U, she was <laughs> <laughs> unveiled as the new well, unveiled. She's the new veiled prophet queen, the <gasps> veiled prophet queen of love and beauty. And that's a picture of her as a youngster. Doesn't quite look 19 there, but we have another photo as well. Is 1999 Elizabeth Claire Kemper, the veiled prophet queen of love and beauty. Now I understand that if you have not been following the controversy over this on Twitter, none of this makes any sense. I followed it and it still doesn't really make any sense. But we did find out that the queen of love and beauty is selected each year from among debutantes who received invitations to this ball, which traditionally excluded non-white attendees. Kemper was a 19 year old student at Princeton when she was crowned the ball's 105th queen. According to a 2014 article in the Atlantic, the events organizers emphasized the existing power structure, if you know what I mean, and banned black and Jewish members. Leading many people to say that she had effectively been crowned queen of the Klan in some <laughs> form back in 1999. Francesca, what is going on? I don't know. This story was one of those stories that broke yesterday and I looked at my phone and I was like, Nope, I'm gonna wait. I am mm, putting phone <laughs> down. I have no opinion until we get we suss this one out, you know, because it it was so bizarre. And you're like, wait a minute. But obviously, yes, it's not the KKK, although not for lack of you know coding <laughs> all of your you know membership around white people. Look, debutante balls are a thing, you know, like uh, high society. <laughs> this is how little I'm like high society <laughs> organizations um, are a thing. I I was part of some like sort of country clubby thing for like a summer, and then I was like, I hate this. I hate this a lot. Like I don't want to. So it, it was just it's like private school kids, and so for me, this story um, was less about. Obviously, the KKK or the fact that like Ellie Kemper is somehow responsible for this, or that she, you know, owes people an apology. We can talk about that later. And really, more about how elitism functions in this country and how mm -hmm. like white, you know, white privilege, white supremacy, if you will, um, that the power structure generally works out for somebody. So here you have someone who is a freshman at Princeton University. She is in a thing. That is called a veiled ball, 
a veiled prophet queen of love and beauty. Like that's that feels like an eyes wide shut red flag right there. But you know, that's, that is some next level thing. And then lo and behold, she becomes a very successful actress who you know has a, you know multiple successful shows, got a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like. As someone, you know, sort of scraping by and like would love, you know, a break and stuff. It is, I'm like, maybe I should have stuck with that country club <laughs> thing that I was doing way back when. Cause I could have mm-hmm. been of I could have been a veiled queen, John. She could have been a veiled contender. <laughs> could have been uh, a veiled contender. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. We'll never know now. You weren't willing to abide by racist. <gasps> I'm Chinese anyway. and they were like, we're just gonna <laughs> not continue. Yeah. Complicated. Um, what do you and like? Think? I I get the Italian thing, but even that's kind of an edge case. We weren't really that comfortable with that. Very like, edge. Um, by the way, she's 19, and that second picture. Why did, can we put that up again? Why does she look? She's 12 years old in that picture. Anyway, that is not the problem here. The, there are several problems, but the main problem is like a lot of people. People were joking on Twitter. I don't think a lot of people were coming out of it like, screw her, we'll never watch a rerun of Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Sure. I, did she know? I mean, she's 19, she's not 12. That said, I don't know what responsibility she bears. I, I was gonna call for a poll on Twitch actually, and it's already up. Is she to blame or not to blame? In the absence of more information, I'm leaning towards I don't see how much she is to blame. Although understand, I am biased by the fact that I find her to be a delight in the shows that she's been in. So maybe that's swaying me, I don't know. What do you think? I find her obnoxious, so I find her obnoxious and I don't think she's to blame. Um, So it's like both. I think the real question is, does she say anything now about it? She hasn't yet, and I believe that she should. She should, she should probably say, Look, and especially in the year 2020, 2021, this moment, you can't stay silent. She'd be like, I've had a lot of good things in my life and I've had a lot of privilege. And I wish that, you know, for many actors and struggling actors uh, who have not been so lucky or whatever, who've not been born into this life, essentially. Like, she's not going to go that far. She might say yeah. something about how she doesn't believe that, you know, elite society clubs or whatever. What was this place called again? The I, it's just it it's some white nonsense to quote so, Kimmy so Schmidt. <laughs> it's some white nonsense. White I don't nonsense know. incorporated. Uh, <sighs> that, yeah, that she doesn't believe they should ban like Jews and blacks, which they don't like. A, like country, golf clubs didn't allow Jewish and black members for a long time, mm-hmm. until like oh, uh, we're just gonna quietly say it's okay in like the late '80s or something. Yeah. Or even later, Bloomberg's club didn't, and it, and it was 22 years ago. Anyway, I, look, I, I do want to I do want to comment on the white nonsense though, because like it's not the case anymore. But for a very long time, people like me were made to feel bad about being into nonsense, nerdy fantasy nonsense, mm-hmm. and all the while. They're all doing it, they just do it in their own form. So if I care about Frodo's journey to Mordor, I'm a nerd. (laughs) If you're going to the ball of the veiled queen of love and beauty, oh, that's high (laughs) society. She could be in my novel, the veiled queen. I'm gonna put a character named the veiled queen of love and beauty and it's gonna be some nonsense in my book. But in yours, it's high society. If I talk about Legolas shooting the Orakai, I'm a nerd. If you tramp around Michigan woods with your militia buddies talking about how you're gonna defend your house from bandits, oh, that's serious business all of a sudden. <laughs> we all like nonsense. I at least know that mine is made up. Mm. I know that mine is fantasy. I don't treat it as real. You all do. Yes, go off, nerd. <gasps> go you're off. All nerds. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Francesca, I think that's that for that, but. We are going to break in a second, but it is only to record our top 10 list for the week. We're gonna be doing the top 10 things that would be in our riders if and when we become important enough to have riders. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna be filming that and releasing it later on today for our tier two and tier three members on YouTube. Um, But until then, Francesca, as always, thank you. Thank you uh, a million times over for uh, taking the reins of the show.
It was so fun. Thank you everyone for sticking around. You know, follow me at Franny Fio on all the things, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you know, be a friend. Join the Frantifa. That's what we call uh, the Bituation Room fans. So right. awesome. <laughs> I'm a fantastic super soldier. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, until then, stay safe out there. Stay sane out there. We'll see you soon.